study, Harden Not Your Hearts. So we've been looking at the section from Matthew chapter 6, where in verse 31 we read, After all these things do the Gentiles see. And he says, Your Father, your heavenly Father, knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So as we've sort of traveled through that, and we've looked at the the law of Moses, we've looked at Israel coming through the wilderness, um, we're going to consider tonight a little bit more of that type of situation, but also look at some of the practical issues. One of which, um, when we come to this subject, especially in North America, and I'm sure it's the same here in the Western world, is that of debt. Um, Come, if you would, to Luke chapter 12 that we had read the other night. Luke chapter 12, and we come in here at the 15th verse where we read here what the Lord has to say. He said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Now that's something that is very difficult in the world that we live in, where it's all about advertising and marketed, geared to the accumulation of stuff, as we talked about in our previous class. I used to work in the advertising industry, and it was all about what we shall eat, and what we shall drink, and wherewithal shall we we be clothed, and what shall we live in, and what shall we drive, and what will we do in our leisure time, and what will we listen to, and what will we play on, and, and so on and so forth. But the Lord wants us not to live our lives uh, consisting of, of simply looking at the stuff that we have, and to be aware, uh, beware of covetousness. Now, I can remember, as a younger man, uh, working for um, a a big company, and um, I was in my boss's office, and um, up drove one of the employees in a swanky new car. And so my boss looked out the window, and I remember him being very happy and telling me, well, that's brilliant that Mark had bought this swanky new car, because the debt, he says, will now force him to stay in my employ. And I was like, wow. That is so cynical, but that's how an employer looked at debt. He looked at it as something that was going to force people to keep serving him. And so when you think about this, we think of the words of the Proverbs. If you come back to Proverbs 22, this is a biblical principle. So in Proverbs chapter 22, and at verse 7 we read, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. So that's a a universal principle in in Scripture, is that the borrower becomes the servant to the lender. So we really need to think about what we do and why we do it. Why why is it that we do certain things that we do? And I can honestly say that Charlene and I, Sister Charlene and I, have made some pretty horrific mistakes in our lives. And you scratch your head and you think, how did I end up here? How did we end up in this situation? Pressure from others, pressure from your boss or whatever it might be to, you know, drive around in a certain type of car and all this kind of stuff. And then you sit back and think, you know, this is ridiculous. The amount of money we're spending on this is just ridiculous. But we've, we've sort of made these decisions and then we quickly decided, well, we better back out of them. And we better make better decisions because you become the servant to the lender. So when we look at this in scripture, if you come over to Romans chapter 13, and, and certainly there is a, a larger meaning to this, but just taking it at, at its face value, I think it's worthwhile just considering this passage. Romans chapter 13, and coming in at the 8th verse, we read, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so when he says here to owe no man anything, the idea is to be in debt for. So that's the principle. And, you know, there was a time when Christadelphians would not take out a mortgage based on this principle. I can remember as a young man that some of the elder brother and sisters just refused to take out mortgages. And, of course, today, with the age of rising house prices, mortgages have become more or less just like rent. And, you know, a lot of people will never actually own their homes. 
Um, and so the, the, uh, the homes are there with security for them. The dangerous problem that we face today, I would say, is more what we call unsecured debt, where people just keep on borrowing and borrowing um, to satiate their desires. They want something, so today you can just simply go out, put it on your card, and you can buy it right now, and you can worry about paying for it later. But what we really need to do is think about what are our wants and what are our needs, and differentiate between the two. Certain things we need in order to live, other things are simply what we want. And so the scriptures are very clear about being content. So let's go over to Hebrews chapter 13. The Apostle Paul is very clear in this, this section when he talks about covetousness. And that is something I would say that in our society is probably one of the most pervasive things. And it's put right on a par with immorality, fornication, adultery, and so on, is covetousness. Now, we don't tend to look at it that way, and we don't kind of put it on that same value level um, because we are man, and we don't mind a little bit of covetousness. Whereas God looks down and sees all those things as equivalent. So if you come to Hebrews chapter 13 and at verse 5, we read, Let your conversation, which of course is our lifestyle, our manner of life, our character, be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Why? For it hath, he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. So when you look at that idea of covetousness, it's one of not loving money is the idea. Without covetousness, it's one Greek word, aphilagoros, which is the idea of philios, which is to love, and agoros, which is money or silver. So this is without the love of money. And that's the way our lives are supposed to be. But of course, we have bombarding us from every direction, every advertisement telling us that we need this item or that item. And so it's something that we, we very much become discontent with our lot in life. And we want more. We want different. We want something more colorful. And you often see this, you know, with young ladies. Those who have the straight hair get it curled. Those who have the curly hair want to straighten it. You know, it's just, it's just our nature. That's the way we are. Um, but the test of faith here is that God says, I will never leave thee, which means to let us sink or loosen his grip on us, to cease to uphold or to give up on us. The problem is, is that we let go of God because we want to put the trust in our own selves and we want more. We don't want what he has given us. We want more than that. And so we covet and we go on from there and we bring upon ourselves hurt. So he says, I will never forsake you, which is the idea of abandon or desert, or to leave helpless or in dire straits. That's what our God says to us. He will be our helper, the one that we can run to. And we looked at this um, in the 18th Psalm, just as a cross-reference there, in Psalm 18, where we talked about the fact in verse 10, the name of Yahweh is a strong tower, the righteous runneth into it and is safe. But the rich man's wealth is his strong tower and has a high wall in his own conceit. And so, of course, destruction comes upon those who put their trust in themselves. So we are put to the test in this very thing as to whether or not we're going to be content with what God has given us or whether we're going to constantly push for more and for more and for more. Now, we're in Hebrews. Let's just go back to chapter 3 here. In Hebrews chapter 3, we read here a very important principle. As Christ, um, but as Christ, but sorry, but Christ as a son over his own house, this is verse 6, whose house we are, but it's qualified. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now the word there, hold fast, it's a nautical term, and it means to steer towards or make for or holding the ship's headway. 
So if you've ever done any sailing, and not the motorboat that you know you zoom down the, the sea or the road, the, uh, the river on, but if you actually have ever sailed, you have to, when it gets stormy, steer into the wind. And that the boats are basically designed to ride the wave so you don't swamp the boat. And that's the idea be, 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 with this word here, the nautical term, is to basically point it in a direction. And so that's what we have to do is hold fast the confidence that we're supposed to have. Well, that's that word elpis, from which we have uh, elpis Israel, the hope of Israel. And it's the idea of a joyful and confident expectation. So it's not a dreariness of wandering through the wilderness and so on. It's a joyful confidence of what we have coming. And we talked about this on, on Wednesday night, about the joy of the kingdom that is coming. And that's what we have to do is to set this firmly in our mind and hold firm for that blessing. And the word there is the idea of being stable, sure, or trusty. So that's the principle that's laid out for us here. Now, Paul goes on to say, as we keep reading here, if we come down to verse 7 of Moses, and he goes on to talk about how that the Holy Spirit saith, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the wilderness, or in the temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, for they do not know my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. So that is what God is trying to teach us. If you will hear his voice, is kind of the, the underlying thing with all of these things. God is trying to teach us when we go through trials that we need to hearken to his voice. And it's every single day that we need to do that. Today, if you will hear his voice. And that's quite often a question I will ask myself. Have I heard the Father's voice today? Have I done my readings? We get busy. And it can also be sometimes even with ecclesial things. We have an AB meeting or activities going on. And I can remember once at an AB meeting, one of the brethren said, well, you know, we don't have time to do the reading. Um, we've got so much on the agenda, we should scrap the reading and just get on with all the stuff on the agenda. And as I was a, probably a cocky little young arranging brother at the time, and I turned around and said, brethren, if we're going to scrap the reading, I'm going to get up and leave right now. Because if we don't have God's voice in any of this, there's no point in us even having a conversation. Um, and I'm not sure it was quite taken in the spirit it was meant, but, um, but that's the point, is that we need to hear his voice each and every day. Because God is trying to teach us in all the circumstances of our life, and we've got to think about what is it that God is leading us to come to understand, rather than becoming rebellious and being murmurous. So we need to ask that question every single day. And as you're probably well aware, this is a quote from the Psalms. So let's go back to Psalm 95, where this comes from. And often, when we are looking at the Bible, and when we're looking through things like this, um, it's very useful to go back and look at the section that the apostle or the Lord, or whoever it might be, is quoting and go back and see it in its original. So back in Psalm 95, we read there, coming in at verse 7, he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So right away, it puts it in perspective. Our Lord is the shepherd, right? He is the one that is leading us. We are the sheep. We are the ones who are to be led and corrected by him. So therefore, and I think of this in, in sense of a flock, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said, my sheep know my voice. Now, in comes the imposter. They don't know his voice. They won't follow him. And so sometimes in ecclesial life, we'll have somebody come along who will suggest certain things. And as sheep, we can hear that voice and go, that's actually not the voice of the shepherd. It's, not, it's incongruous with the word as we come to understand it. And I can remember um, as a little boy, my son sitting at the table, um, his mother and his grandmother were having a disagreement on something. I wouldn't really call it an argument, 
But of course, the little gaffer is always going to take Nana's side. And so he just turned around to Mummy and said, chapter and verse, Mummy. I think he was about three years old, right? So, but that was kind of the thing in our home is like, give us a proof. Where does it come from? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to these things, it's because there's no light in them. So we are to hear his voice. And that word is Shema, to hear with understanding and to respond. And we are not to harden our hearts. So the word there is to be stiff or stubborn, to be obstinate or difficult. And we can think of that if you've ever seen a little two-year-old, you know, who when they're uh, chastised by the parent or whatever else, might have that momentary little defiance where all the muscles on the back all tighten up and it's no, you know, that is stiff neckness in its absolute, you know, empirical form of a little two-year-old. And that is what children will do. But we can also do that with a father. We can turn around and we can provoke him. And of course, you'll know that these are two phrases that come from the wilderness wanderings. The provocation is the Mirabah, which was the name of the fountain in Rephidim, which means strife, contention, or uh, to uh, contention, to, to tempt. And the word temptation, which is my or Maka, Massa, which is the name of the place in the wilderness where Israel tempted their God. So this is the picture that Paul is drawing on, and he's saying, as sheep, we need to hear the voice of the master. We need to be listening for that voice. And so in Psalm 95 and verse 10, he says, 40 long years I was grieved with this generation and said, it is a people that do err in their heart. Why? Why did Israel constantly err? Well, they have not known my ways unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into his rest, into, into my rest. So they erred, they wandered, they went astray, they were intoxicated is the idea. So you think of a, of a drunk person who really doesn't know which direction they're going in. That's was Israel going through the wilderness. They were inebriated because they weren't clear on what the word of Yahweh was. Their hearts wandered because they were intoxicated with the cares of this life. And so it's his ways that he's interested in here, which of course is this idea of derek, which is the, the moral character, the way in which we decide to walk. So God's ways are his character, as we know, basic first principles, Exodus chapter 33, Moses says, show me thy ways that I may know thee. And he turns around to him and he says, um, you know, uh, this is my name. And then he reveals his character in chapter 34. So his name is his character, which is his ways. So when we think of Israel, let's just go back to Israel in the wilderness there. As we, well, actually stay in Psalm 78 um, or in the Psalms to chapter, or Psalm 78, I should say, just a minute. Because um, this picks up on those wilderness wanderings there and some of the miracles that took place. And we looked at a couple of these the other night, um, but just to kind of put it into, into reference here, how fickle Israel was. In verse 10, they kept not the covenant of God, refused to walk in his law, and forgot his works, his wonders that he had showed them, marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoar. So here they are, and we can be just like them. We can forget how God has worked in the past. We can forget what he has done. And we can even do that as Christadelphians. I can think to my great-grandparents who witnessed 1917. They saw Allenby go into Jerusalem. They saw the Ottoman Turks kicked out, just as Brother, Promise, Brother Thomas had prophesied um, 70 years before, how these things would be dried up. And it absolutely gripped the community at the time. And then my grandparents, they witnessed 1948. And they saw how basically God brought Israel back into the land and established the state of Israel. And their hearts were thrilled at those things. And then my parents witnessed 1967. And they saw how that God brought back Judah and Jerusalem. My first memory that I can actually think of is 1973, when as a little gaffer, I was hushed, rushed out the kitchen because dad was listening to the Yom Kippur War on the wireless radio. And I would have been about two and a bit years old. And, and that's the first thing I can actually put a date to and kind of correspond with. But those were exciting times that brethren and sisters saw. Those are the miracles, so to speak, that our community has witnessed. Yet my generation, we can forget those things. 
And you can sort of like, oh yeah, well that's always been. Since I've been alive, Israel's always been in the land. Since I've been alive, Judah and Jerusalem have always been in Jewish hands. So the miracles kind of get forgotten in this promised land age, um, or in this age, sorry, similar as they did as Israel journeyed to the promised land. I mean, you, you can think about, well, how on earth did they go astray? Every day, there's a pillar of fire. That's not normal, but it became normal to them. Every day, there is a cloud that covers them and protects them for the heat. That big cloud that would come up from the tabernacle and would go out over the whole congregation like a great big umbrella to protect them from the heat as they're in the desert. And yet, they forgot about that, even though it's staring them in the face. And we can do that too, and that's why Bible prophecy is important to keep reminding ourselves these are the miracles that God has performed in our lifetimes. So when we look at this, if we look at Psalm 17, just back a few chapters or a few uh, psalms back into uh, the 17th Psalm, and just consider these words, sorry, Exodus 17, I can't read my own screen. Here we go, Exodus chapter 17, um, and here we have in verse 1, all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys. According to the commandment of Yahweh, they pitched in Rephidim, and there there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt Yahweh? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that you have brought us out of the land of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? The burning question of the day, what shall we drink? I mean, that is Matthew 6. What shall we drink? What shall we eat? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? And of course, an impossible situation. And brothers and sisters, we have some of those impossible situations in our lives. And yet with the stroke of the rod, the waters gushed forth. Keep going in Exodus chapter 17 in verse 4. Moses cried to Yahweh saying, what shall I do to this people? They'd be almost ready to stone me. And Yahweh said to Moses, go on before the people, take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Again, this is the one that turned the waters into blood. This is the one that opened the rivers up. Take this before them. Uh, behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come out water of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of all the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, because they tempted Yahweh. And what was their question? The burning question was, is Yahweh among us or not? And that, brothers and sisters, is the question of our lives. Do we really believe there is a God in heaven? Is Yahweh among us or not? Because we can go about trying to do everything that we do in our own strength, or we can think about this question. Is Yahweh among us or not? And so, of course, God was amongst them, and it was demonstrated to them with the same rod that had parted the Red Sea. And so the miracles they had forgotten were ones that God would remind them of. And so if we think back to Psalm 78, um, probably should have told you to put a marker there, uh, back to Psalm 78, as we consider you know, the commentary on this by the psalmist as he goes through these things, Psalm 78 verse 15, he clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths he brought streams also out of the rocks and caused the rivers to run, or caused the waters to run down like rivers. An impossible situation solved by the Creator in a matter of seconds. And that's the great things that God can do for Israel. And that's what the psalmist reflects on here. And it's well worth going through the study of this with our children. And, and looking at things like Psalm 78 and picking out those situations in the wilderness that it comments on. And so the Israelites, though, were very hard-hearted 
and slow to trust in God even after this miracle, as we come to in, in verse 17. Yet they sinned more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness, and they tempted God in their heart, asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God, and they said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock, and waters gushed out, and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? So we know he can do what shall we drink, but we're not so sure whether he can handle what shall, he, what shall we eat. And of course, once again, God deals with this, and Israel fell under the same issue. Um, when Luke 24, verse 25, we won't look it up, but the Lord said to them, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So this was the issue. And you can really think about that in terms of us. Just like Israel, you know, when we come into problems, we can look back and sometimes see the hand of God in our lives or our parents' lives. And we can say, oh, yes, well, there was this issue where we were in dire straits and God helped us out. Oh, but the next issue is just above him. And then we looked at how God or how the children of Israel limited, um, you know, the power of God. He can go this far, but he can't go beyond that. So we can be just like Israel and ask the same questions. Can, provide, can God provide bread or water in the wilderness for us today? And so when we look at that and we consider how God does indeed furnish a table in the wilderness, if we keep reading down to verse 22, what was the issue? They believed not in God and they trusted not in his salvation, though he had commanded clouds from above, opened the doors of heaven, had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them the corn of heaven, mandated the angels' food, and he sent them meat to the full. But that was the problem, right? They didn't believe. And the word there is that word aman, which is where we get our word amen from at the end of a prayer, where we say this is truth, this is solid, we believe in this. And it actually comes from the word that means the pillars on which a house is standing. So remember when um, Samson pushed the pillow, pillars and the whole house collapsed? That's this word aman. It's the pillar that holds up the whole house. And that's the word belief or the word faith in many ways in the Old Testament, where basically they believe not and, of course, they trusted not. They didn't put their confidence in. They didn't feel bold and secure in, in these things. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? And wherewithal shall we be clothed? Now, if you come back to Matthew, um, this, of course, is the issue of the day that we've been talking about this past week. In Matthew, the same issues hit us. Um, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, he says, Wherefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life. And that word there, take no thought, is the idea of being anxious, troubled, or looking of the cares over something, seeking something, one's own interest to promote them. This is what they were not supposed to do. What were the issues in the wilderness? The same issues the Lord brings up here. What ye shall eat. And they had manna provided for them in the wilderness. What ye shall drink. And Israel basically had water from the rock in the wilderness. And what ye shall put on, of course, there was the whole issue of them being provided for in the wilderness, where their clothes did not wear out, their shoes that were on their feet did not wear out, and the poor kiddies had to deal with the hand-me-downs from generation to generation to generation. And I'm sure many of you remember that. We have photos that my mother has of my brother and I. And, you know, year one, my brother's in school, I'm not. He's got the green sweater on. Year two, I'm now in the school, I've got the green sweater, he's got the brown one. Year three, I have the brown sweater, he's got a blue one. Year four, I've got the blue one, he's got a maroon one, or whatever it was. And literally every single year, because we were always photographed in the same picture, you see that sweater moving on. And, uh, you know, that's all the jumper, basically. So that's, that's the thing, is that God provided for them in the wilderness, and he will do the same for us as well. But we are warned, if we come back to Hebrews chapter 3, to take heed, to, to look at Israel, to look at what they went through, and look at the words of the Lord to the apostles, and make sure that we are not considering ourselves a little above them, because we can run into the same everyday things of life. So if we come back to Hebrews chapter 3, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you 
an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so that's the issue, is that we can be hardened in our hearts, just as Israel was in the wilderness, through the deceitfulness of sin. And of course, we have that in Jeremiah. You know, when we look at those core first principles, the heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. It's deceitful above all things. And so there it is. And, and so an evil heart of unbelief can be in any of us because we're all made of the same f flesh. And what it can do is we can be hardened through those things. And the world can do that to us. So we have to be aware of that. And we have to remember that Yahweh hath done great things for us. And this was the case for Israel as they came through the wilderness, but also as they came out the other side. Come back to Psalm 126. Again, this is, is a psalm that is very parallel to the days of, of the, um, the kingdom of Israel. And after that fact, Ezra and Nehemiah. So Psalm 126. And here we have in verse 1. When Yahweh turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the nations, Yahweh hath done great things for them. And that's the testimony of Rahab. And he says, Yahweh hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Yahweh, as the streams of the south. Now, brothers and sisters, God has turned again our captivity because we were captive to sin. But we have been brought out of the world, and Yahweh has done great things for us. Wherefore, we are like them that dream with the prospect of what God has done for us eternally. And as we looked at Wednesday night, the great and powerful things that he has done, the great things, they are powerful and important works that he has done. And so he goes on to say here in this 126th Psalm, as we kind of consider um, the process, because it's not always a, a snap your fingers and it's all done. So when we go here, we, we look at verse 5, where the psalmist goes on to say, the picture is of a farmer taking his precious seed and scattering it in faith. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth with weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So this is the idea. They go out, and there will be times for us in our journeys as well when there are times of weeping. So you think of the end of the year. You think of the end of the harvest, and you've got all your grain, and that's what your family has eaten during this year. Now you come to the end of that period of time, and you have to take the food that you've got left, or a portion of it, and you have to go out and sow that in faith, believing that God's going to bring that back to you as sheaves that you will bring rejoicing, as it said. And the word there is a ringing cry, proclaiming joy and praise to our God. Now, our God puts us in, 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 in trials so that we have to trust our God in the same way. Trust that he will bless the harvest, even though the garners are running empty, and share that same sentiment with the farmer here who goes out and sows in tears. And if you look at the beginning of Psalm 128 that follows on from this, blessed is every one that feareth Yahweh and walketh in his ways, for thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. So this is the idea. Um, those who fear, and the idea of fearing here is to have in reverent awe, um, fearing Yahweh, and of course, they are walking, and again, that's that same word, direct, the idea of the course of life or the moral character. And by doing that, they walk in fear. They walk in his ways. And what's the result? Well, the result here is it will be well with thee, and the word there is prosperity. So, in other words, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, walking in his ways, fearing Yahweh, and thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. All these things will be delivered unto you. And so that's the same principle that we have over and over. Trust and blessing go hand in hand. So we have it here in verse 4. 
Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth Yahweh. Yahweh shall bless thee out of Zion. Thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. So it's not something that necessarily comes easy for us. It's something that we have to learn to put our trust in our God, in the simple things of our daily lives. So the 141st Psalm goes on to say, But mine eyes are unto thee, O Yahweh, the Lord in thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. And so we have to set our eyes, eye in, uh, our mental and spiritual faculties upon our God. And of course, we think of Ein Gedi, the well of Gedi. That's the word I in the Hebrew because it's the idea of a fountain. That's where the tears come from, right? So here we have the eyes, the Ein, where the mental and sp spiritual faculties that basically are focusing on our God and putting our trust in him. Now, when we look at this, we go through our struggles in life. Um, we are exhorted, if you come to the 55th Psalm, that we have to put our burdens at God's, uh, uh, cast them upon Yahweh themselves. So in, in Psalm 55, in the 22nd verse, we read, cast thy burden upon Yahweh, and he shall sustain thee. And we sang this the other night. It's a piece out of Mendelssohn's Elijah that we pulled into our hymn book. Cast thy burden upon Yahweh, he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. And the idea of casting there is to fling, to throw away, to cast off our burdens and to give them over to our God. Our burdens, of course, being the lot which we have been given, the things that we must carry. And your burden is going to be different than my burden. I am burdened with certain things, certain health issues maybe, or whatever they might be, financial problems. You have different ones. But the thing is, is we have to cast them upon Yahweh. We have to put them at his feet. And he will sustain us, and the word there is to support, to nourish, to measure or to calculate. He's going to figure out what we need and he's going to provide that to us. And so he says the righteous will never be moved and the word there literally means to shake or to totter or to waver. So we can think of wavering, you know, the one that wavers like at the sea. Um, that's what he says the righteous won't be if he puts his trust in Yahweh he will never suffer him to, to, to waver or to totter. And so that's the principle that we get out of the study as we look at seeking first the kingdom of God. It's much more than just, you know, our daily bread, so to speak. It's every aspect of our lives and putting our trust and our hope in our God. So Psalm 145, Yahweh upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, thou givest them their meat in due season. So here we have the idea of God lifting us up, raising up those that are bowed down. If their eyes are set on him, he gives them their meat in due season. Now, those are some of those principles that we've looked at. And we want to just change gears for a moment and look at a couple of other ones that I think in this day and age are very important. One of which is put not your trust in princes. So if we're in Psalm 145, let's go at 146. This is where we read this, and we use this as a first principle. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returns to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. So we have great men of the world that all people look up to, like this Charlie here, Elon Musk. He's the new latest and greatest golden child. And, you know, there's the books that, that Elon Musk thinks that you should read so that you can have success in your life. And if it's not him, it'll be somebody else and so on and so forth. He's a builder of cars. So was Henry Ford. Well, where is Henry Ford today? Long gone. You know, and, and who talks about Henry Ford a whole lot anymore? Not too many people. Uh, put not your confidence in the world's men because they have no help that they can give you, no salvation, no deliverance whatsoever. And once they're gone, their thoughts perish, right? They're absolutely gone. Their, their thoughts, which is the idea or the gleaming or the shining of them is gone. In a flash, it just disappears and they're no longer there. 
And so then it's the next Charlie that comes along that everybody says, oh, we've got to listen to this guy, um, whatever he's come up with, whatever his success might be. So when we look at that, as we, as we go over to, to Psalm 49 and continue this thought, as we think of if we were to put our trust in the world, if we were to put our trust in the theories and the philosophies of you know, seemingly successful people, um, the psalmist warns us in verse 6, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother. Elon Musk can do nothing for your eternal salvation. He might be able to help your pocketbook for a little bit, maybe, but he can do nothing for eternal salvation. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a, a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. That he should still live forever and not see corruption, there's nothing they can do to solve that problem. And so you, you think back of some of the great inventors, you know, we don't need to go that far, just go back and look at Steve Jobs of Apple. Where is he now? Well, he's seen corruption, he's gone. So he says, he seeth that the wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish Persian perish. They leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. And that's the, the truth, brothers and sisters. That's the reality. So my boss, he named his company Rick Tur. Richard and Terry, his two sons, right? Naming it after basically his, his prodigy and this is his sort of thing. And of course now he's dead. And the company's dead too, it's gone. Rick and Terry are still around, but the company for all intents and purposes is completely gone and there was nothing he could do to stop it. It's finished. And so we cannot allow ourselves, brothers and sisters and young people, to get wrapped up in this world and to put our trust in these things because they're all going to go. Go to Psalm 146. So here's the, the reverse to this. Happy is he, verse 5, that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in Yahweh his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is therein is, which keepeth truth forever, which exerciseth judgment for the oppressed, giveth food to the hungry, Yahweh looseth the prisoners, Yahweh openeth the eyes of the blind, raises up them that are bowed down, Yahweh loveth the righteous, Yahweh preserveth the strangers, he relieveth the fatherless and the widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. Yahweh shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Hallelujah. Praise ye Yahweh. And so when you think about this, and you think of faithful men in the Bible, like David, if you just come back to the 144th Psalm, where did they put their trust? Did they put it in their own prowess? Did David put his trust in defeating Goliath by knocking clay pots off a fence with his sling? Is that what he, you know, he practiced up really good so he figured I can take this guy? Absolutely not. What does he say here in the 144th Psalm? Blessed be Yahweh, my strength which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. This was the one. His university or college or apprenticeship was with God when it came to ruling his people. He teacheth me his learning or training or his exercise. No matter what training we may have on a secular level, and whatever innate abilities we may have, it's God who gives us our skills. And he goes on to describe him as his high tower, that place where he will go to refuge, inaccessibly high, too high for capture. And he is his deliverer, the one who he will escape to, his security, and he is his shield. Interestingly, that's the word magen, um, if you go to Israel, they don't have ambulances with red crosses on them. They have the Star of David, and they're called Magen David, the Shield of David. And so they are the buckler, or the ganan, meaning to defend, to cover, to surround. 
And so that was the situation of David. That was his shield. He didn't have a shield. If you think when he runs to fight Goliath, Goliath's got a shield and a shield bearer. Saul had a shield, a brass as well. David's shield was invisible. It was almighty God himself. And that's what he trusted in. And he teaches his fingers to fight and his hands to war. Interestingly, we were just reading in Leviticus, yesterday I think it was, that they were doing the service of the tabernacle, warring the warfare. That's what the Levites were doing. That's what ecclesial life is. It's warring the warfare. And God teaches his fingers to fight and his hands to war. And so when we look at this and we consider David, um, that's the, the, the passage there. Fingers to fight and hands to war. But keep reading here. Because sometimes we don't always look at the context. Come down to verse uh, 13. What's the result? That our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands, ten thousands in our streets, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is is Yahweh. So it's not just about fighting. It's about everyday life. He teaches her fingers to fight and her hands to war. So brother, if you're good at your job, and if you're good at what you do, and God has blessed you, thank him for teaching you to have fingers to fight and hands to war. Your skills that he has given you are from him. Any abilities, sister, that you may have, have come from the Heavenly Father himself. Use them in the service and the work of the truth, so that our garments may be full. And there's no complaining in our streets. Now, that's an interesting one. You know, we have God as our fortress. There should be no complaining amongst us. I mean, what was Israel's sin in the wilderness? Wandering around, murmuring and complaining. We cannot afford to be a people that way. We've just spent the afternoon going through Heritage College here. Sister Charlene and I were involved in the establishment of Heritage College in Ontario um, some 10 or 20 years ago now. Um, and it's such a blessing, such a blessing for our community, for your community to here, to have such a thing that God has provided such a sanctuary in the wilderness. Now, it's never going to be perfect because all those little children in there are all little flesh pots, right? They're all full of uh, sinful nature as you and I are, and you'll still have fights in the, in, the, in the change rooms and on the playgrounds and whatever else. That's just the way human nature is. But God has given you and us a sanctuary with which to raise our children with. There should be no murmuring or complaining with it. We should be thankful. Now, 20 years on, sometimes we forget. We forget what a blessing it is because we don't have the contrast of what went before. Like Israel in the wilderness, you know, there's the pillar of fire and there's the, the cloud and we just kind of take it for granted. But we always want to remember what our God has done for us in this latter day when the world is becoming so hideous and be thankful to our God that he has provided such a thing. And so the exhortation to us comes into the words of Haggai, where we are to consider our ways. Now, we're going to go to Haggai in a minute, but I want to go back to Ruth. We talked about this at the sisters' class momentarily the other day. But let's just go back to Ruth for a moment, because in Ruth, we have the situation that is described for us. See, sometimes we make mistakes in our lives, but God can work through those mistakes, so we read in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, it came to pass in those days when the judges ruled that there was famine in the land. So when you hear the days that the judges ruled, previous chapter, last couple of verses, you know, when you have there, every man did which was right in his own eyes. And so there's a man of Bethlehem, Judah, that went to sojourn in the land of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of his, the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife Naomi, the name of his two sons Marlon and Kilian. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. So they started off, this was to be a sojourn, a temporary dwelling, just for a period of time until all the troubles in our ecclesia at home were over. However, they ended up continuing there. 
establishing or abiding themselves, abiding there, remaining there. They established themselves. And so finally, they ended up dwelling there, which literally means to sit down, to remain, or to inhabit. They'd become tied to that population. Now, you think of the situation. Marlon and Killian, they, they are the young boys that are left after Elimelech dies. Now, at that point, Naomi could have said, ooh, you know, let's go back to Bethlehem, Judah. But she didn't. She stayed there. Anyone ever wondered why she stayed there? Well, because Marlon and Killian had become engrossed in the population. They had friends. They no doubt went to school. They had their friends, and these friends became girlfriends. And of course, they end up getting married, and they end up dwelling there. So she's left with her two sons, and they end up um, dying also, as we read in verse 5. Marlon and Killian died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her, her two sons and her husband. And so she says to her daughters-in-law in verse 13, it grieveth me for your sakes that the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. She says, I'm sorry for you that you are experiencing the circumstances of my bad decision. And brothers and sisters, there come, come times in life where we make wrong decisions. And we put ourselves and our families in a wrong place. And sometimes there's consequences to that. I grew up in isolation for a little while. Thankfully, my father moved us out of isolation before we really became, we were just early teenagers. And we were able to then be with another ecclesia where there were there's lots of other young people for us to be with. And so here we had the situation. She recognizes that Yahweh had dealt bitterly with her. She goes on to say, uh, call me not Naomi, uh, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And when, why call ye Naomi, seeing Yahweh hath testified against me, and Yahweh hath afflicted me? So the idea bitterly is to deal strongly with and to have a strong taste in the mouth. So we think of a sour taste that you get in your mouth. That's what she says. That's what my life has become. And he has testified against me. He has responded as a witness and he has afflicted me, which literally means to break or to shatter. And she takes full responsibility for her actions. I went out full. Yahweh hath brought me home again empty. And there will come times in your life where you will make decisions that you think that was a really bad decision. And you perhaps couldn't see it at the time looking forward, but you can look back and say that was a, a bad decision and I'm now in a wrong place. And, and what she had to do then was to make a decision. What am I going to do after this? God had broken her rebellious spirit and had brought her back. I went out full, but Yahweh hath brought me back again empty. And so there are times when we get ourselves in a mess and we have to make better decisions. And so let's go to Haggai, because that's the message of Haggai, is to consider our ways. And I often think of, of Naomi as a great example of somebody who considered her ways and then took steps, drastic steps, to go back to the land of Israel. And she knew it was going to be tough, but there was nowhere else that she could go. So let's go back to Haggai, chapter 1, that we had read together. Thus speaketh Yahweh of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that Yahweh's house should be built. Then came the word of Yahweh by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? So that was the problem. They said, look, it's not time to get involved in ecclesial work. There's other things more pressing, more domestic things that we have to take care of. It's not time for us to do this. But they were busy, you'll notice. They already had houses, but they were sealing their houses. Now, we think of the word sealing as maybe keeping the lizards out or whatever. Um, we were visited by one of those little lizards uh, earlier um, yesterday, I think it was. Um, not in the house, by the way, just in the, in the garden there. Um, but the idea is not actually of, of sealing in this way, but it's wainscoting. It's the idea of boarding or paneling. It's the decorating of the house. So they already had the house. They already had somewhere to live, but they were putting off. They were busy decorating the houses, their own houses, while God's house lied waste. And God goes on to say in verse 5, Now therefore, thus saith Yahweh of hosts, consider your ways. And that's the idea. It's made up of several Hebrew words, which basically mean to place in order the heart over and above. 
So put your heart over and above. Set your understanding in order to, to see what's going on here. Consider your ways, and again, that's the word derek, which is the manner of life, the road, or direction. Look at which way you're going. Think about what you're doing. Think about what is happening in your life. What is important? And so he says, look, you have sown much, you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that eateth wages, earneth wages to put them into a bag with holes. Now, I don't know if you picked it up there, but this is Matthew chapter 6. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? And wherewithal shall we be clothed? It's all there in Haggai. And he goes on to say there's more than that, though it's also sowing and earning wages, right? So it's all there in that little message, message in Haggai. And God says, look, you're doing all these things rather than looking after my house. So I'm going to work against you in these things. He says, but haven't you noticed you've never got enough? You've never got enough to eat. You've never got enough to drink. You don't have enough to, you put clothes on, you're not warm. You earn wages, you put them into a bag with holes. Now, a bag with holes is what we call a sieve, right? And so that's what it's like. You put your money in and it just keeps going out. By the way, sieve spelt backwards is visa, a sieve, right? So just be careful what you do with your money. But here's the issue, is why is it that they were doing, they were having such a problem? Well, it's because they weren't seeking first the kingdom of God. So God says, look, you looked for much, and lo, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew on it. Why, saith Yahweh of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste, and you're running every man to his own house. Therefore, because of this, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, the earth is stayed from her fruit, and I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, and upon that which uh, the ground bringeth forth, upon men and cattle, and upon all the labor of your hands. So sometimes when we're in life struggling away, and we're always putting, you know, work first or family first in the sense of, you know, we need a bigger house, bigger car, whatever it might be. All of those things that we're trying to do, God works against us. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that in your life. We certainly have in some of the mistakes that we've made where you kind of sit there and think, what is going on? And then you realize, what are we doing? This is not what our God called us to do. We need to consider our ways. We need to reflect on these things. God was the source of their prosperity, but they'd forgotten that. He was the one that would provide for them, but they'd forgotten that. So they were out there doing it in their own strength. So he says, well, you know, the curse in Genesis, I'm doubling that, and I'm going to put a drought on all the things that you want to do here, the oil, the wine, everything that the ground brings forth, all the labor of your hands, I'm going to put a stop to it to get them to think about what they were doing. So Haggai goes on in, in verse 7, and he, and he says, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, consider your ways. He says, go up to the mountain, bring wood, build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith Yahweh. Consider your ways. Now we can look at that and think, oh, Israel, back at the time of Zechariah, or Z uh, Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, what a terrible lot. But well, what is the house that we're supposed to be building? Hebrews 3 verse 6, whose house we are. This is the house of Yahweh. And he says, well, this is the house that we are. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 16, you are the temple of the living God. So it's not talking about maintenance at the ecclesial hall either, by the way, just to kind of caveat that, because sometimes we can get fixated on that, what color the carpet is or whatever it might be. That's not the issue here. The issue here is providing meat in his house. So we cannot become entangled in the things of this life, so much so that the work of the Lord gets put on the side. Come over to Second Peter. I think we may have referenced this the other day. Um, it's this idea of interweaving. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. Therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And as we looked at, that word literally means to interweave, like plating like the braids of hair. 
We cannot be interweaved or so much so involved with the pragmatia, the pragmatic things of this life, the prosecution of affairs, business, or occupation, so much so that the house of Yahweh is left ruined. And so we really need to look at this. And, and we have that. Peter picks it up in 2 Peter 2, verse 20. For after they have escaped the pollution of the, of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they're entangled therein and overcome, and the latter end of them is worse than the beginning. So if we leave the world behind and make our commitment to our God, and then we go back to all those things like a dog, um, or a, a dog returning to his vomit, as the, the, the Proverbs rather grossly puts it, but you kind of get the point, or a, a sow that was washed back into to wallow in the mire, he says we can't go back to those things. That's the proverb that's, that's talked about here. We have to remember what our God has called us to. And so remember the words of Mark 4, one of the other uh, gospel records speaking of this. When we think about then what the Lord had to say in Mark chapter 4 and verse 18, when we, we looked at the, the parable of the sower, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this life, and the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So we have the anxieties of this life, all those things that makes us, make us anxious and that we, we worry about, the deceitful, the deceitfulness of riches, the, the, the pleasant illusion. The idea is the root of the word is to beguile or to cheat. So you think this is something that you want, but you realize that you, you get cheated by these things. We get fooled by them. They enter in. It's the same idea of putting food in the mouth. That takes you right the way back to um, Genesis chapter 3. They saw the fruit. And what did they do? They put it in their mouths. So we cannot allow ourselves to taste of these things because what will happen, they will compete for our affections and eventually we will be choked, which literally means to be suffocated or to throng around. Because that's the problem that we can get into. And so the Lord tells us, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with serviting and drunkenness. Oh, that would never be me. But what about the cares of this life? That can easily be us, so that day come upon you unawares. And so the, the exhortation to us, as it comes out in the Apostle John's record, or his letter in 1st of John, um, and chapter 2, if we just come over to the Epistle of John, 1st of John chapter 2 is very clear. I mean, we lose, use this as a first principle, but there's a practical side to this. In verse 15, love not the world neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But notice it's not just love the world, love not the world, it's love not the things that are in the world. And sometimes that's a little harder for, oh, we don't love the world. We look at the world and all its corruption, whatever else, and mm, that's not me. You know, I, I don't like those things. But what about the things that are in the world? Well, that's a different story. You know, I gotta have this and I gotta have that and a bigger one of that and whatever it might be. And so he goes on to say, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and this sums it all up, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we can't become entangled with the affairs of this life, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and love the things that will choke us and make us unfruitful in the word, because all of that's going to pass away. But if we are about our Father's business and do the will of the Father, we will indeed abide forever. Now let's just take a look. We've just got a minute or so. Well, I probably don't have any minutes left, but we're going to take a minute. Just come over to Philippians um, as we consider here the apostles' look on this. I mean, you think of the Apostle Paul, and you look at his relation to this world's good. It's absolutely amazing to read what he says. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. What things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. I mean, that's a pretty strong reference that he makes there. 
I count them as excrement. That's, he says, what they are for me. And you just think of that, and you think like, wow, you know, do I count those things that way? Or do I love them? And, and that's where he says, look, the loss of all those things, when I've got the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. But you see, brothers and sisters, it's all about what we absolutely love. Because if we love the things of God, they're eternal. And they will continue on forever. If we love the things of this world, they're just transitory. And they will, like the flower, they will fade away. And we will fade away with them if that's where our hearts are. So there's a liberty in not being entangled in this life. And again, there's, there's more to this passage than this. But stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith have Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, obviously, Galatians 5, there's more to it than that. But take the principle. Don't be entangled again with those things that choke everybody around us. And enjoy the liberty that we have in Christ. The liberty that we have in the gospel. And that we have, basically, to serve our Lord in all that we do it. And so we think about that, and we can think of just the words of, of Ecclesiastes. You don't have to look this one up, but he that loveth silver, Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10, shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with the increase. It's, it's also vanity, says, says uh, Solomon. In our materialistic world, though, we don't always look at it that way. Colossians tells us, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, oh, that's not me, uncleanness, that's not me, inordinate affection, oh, not me, uh, evil concupiscence, not me either, um, ooh, covetousness, which is idolatry. That's our world. I mean, it's all the other things too. But that can be us, even in the ecclesia, when we you sort of put all those other things aside. The world can bring upon us covetousness, which is idolatry, which was Israel in the wilderness. Wanting things that God hadn't given them. He'd provided what we shall eat, what we shall drink, and wherewithal shall we be clothed. But they tempted him, and they hardened their hearts in the wilderness because they coveted what he hadn't given them. And that, brothers and sisters, can be us. Covetousness, he says, is idolatry. Just a quick couple of examples to, to close our thoughts off. Uh, you know, the story of... of um, Elisha and Gehazi. You know, what was it that he says to him when, when he says, look, where have you been? And he says, well, I, I didn't go anywhere. And he says to him, went not my heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and maidservants and men servants? What is he talking about? It's lands garments, what we shall put on, olive and vineyards, what we shall eat. All of those things are all tied up in this. He says, is that what the time is for Gehazi? Went mark my heart with you. You can just feel Elisha's pain at this young man's foolish choices. And so we have to ask ourselves at the same time, is it time to receive money? Or should our focus be on the kingdom? And we have other examples, of course, all the way through scripture. You've got Joshua, and the story of Achan. You have Acts, and you've got Ananias and Sapphira, all brethren and sisters in the ecclesia, as was Gehazi, who put their heart into the things of this world and lost their life. Now, one little caveat I just want to throw in, and that is that, you know, to sort of counterbalance this, he who doesn't work doesn't eat. It doesn't mean that we sit back and we just wait for God to sort of fill our garners, and we do absolutely nothing. And this is just a little proscript, really, to our conversation as we've looked at it this week. Just one passage we'll pick up. The Apostle Paul says, Yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we have behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither do eat any man's bread uh, for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to anybody, not because we have not power to make ourselves an example unto you, um, uh, sorry, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. And so they wrought with their hands day and night, and they were an example to the ecclesia. They were a tupos, a type, which is the idea of a, of a stroke, where we get our word type from. Um, and they were basically to 
eat with their own, uh, eat their bread with their own hands. And in fact, just to, to finish that off, he says there, um, you know, if any should not work, neither should he eat, but rather with quietness, let them work and let them eat their own bread. And that's the principle, really, that we have in the, the scriptures that counterbalances this, that we can't just turn around and say, well, God's going to do it all for me. I don't need to do anything myself. So I just want to end um, by looking at this concept of redeeming the time. Whatever time we've got, we've got to use it for our God. Um, one last verse, and that's going to be Ephesians chapter 5. Um, and if you just come in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14, where we are clearly instructed um, by the Apostle Paul here um, that we meet, need to make use of our time above all. Wherefore, he saith, awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And so that word there that we talked about at sister's class, circumspectly, is to walk accurately, exactly, and diligently. It's the idea of walking with purpose. And especially young people, I would say this to you, don't just let your lives happen where, you know, you go to school and then you go on to a job and you go on to this and, and you end up sort of like, you know, it's like one of the, the um, great sort of uh, positive thinking guys says, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up somewhere else. And he's taking that actually from the Proverbs, you know, where there is no vision, the people perish or are made naked. And that's what will happen in your life. If you don't walk circumspectly, which means accurately, diligently, really think about where you're, what you're going to do with your life. You'll end up later on in, in mid-age, you know, if the Lord remains away, and thinking like, well, how did I get here? It's not really what I wanted to be. It's not where, and I've kind of painted myself into a corner. Walk circumspectly with purpose and really think about what you want to do with your life. Redeeming the time, ransoming, buying off, buying up for oneself, making sacred use of every opportunity for doing good. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. And you can look around there and, you know, the world might seem shiny to you, but it's never been, I would say, so evil as it is today. Redeeming the time for the days are evil, understand what the will of the Lord is and be about our Father's business.